Um, I would like to um, present um, our next um, item on the program, which is the final one for today, which is one that's really, really special, I think, to me and to many, many people. Um, the Elaine Salo um, Reading Group, Reading Elaine Salo as an Act of Feminist Solidarities and Decolonial Healing. It'll be presented, I'm going to be very quick so that we can get into it. It'll be presented by um, Yaliwe Clark, Coney Benson, and Lorna Houston. Benita Moorman is unable to join us today. Um, but um, it takes me back to the beautiful memories of a beautiful person and the amazing feminist and collegial, loving um, person that was Elaine Salo. Um, so we read and we are reading Elaine Salo. I invite the three panelists to please um, switch on their cameras um, and all of you to please listen in. Good evening, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Wonderful. Can you see me? Perfectly. <laughs> I can awesome. see myself. Oh, I have to scroll this way. This strange world of Zoom where we get used to seeing ourselves to check if we exist in the digital exchange. Very strange. Okay, I see also now Connie and Lorna here. Yes, so thank you so much um, for this opportunity to convene for us, which is uh, for us our series of um, conversations that we have regularly as this reading group, the Elaine Sello Reading Group. And um, I think Connie, you remember how many we've had. I can't remember how many we've had, but ever since Elaine Sello's passing, uh, in 2016, we have been convening, I think from the following year onwards, um, sometimes as many as three to four times a year, sometimes more. Of course, it's been much harder in the last uh, um, a year and a half to two years of living through this, this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so what we're doing here is really, uh, uh, um, having a reading group. Uh, what we're doing is, is uh, um, bringing to life the story of Elaine Sello and we're bringing it to life in community uh, with other people who may or may not have known or read Elaine Sello. And we've titled this, this uh, um, reading group for this AFEMS conference. And I miss, I miss Benita Moorman because she was really took lead in curating this particular one. And uh, she took lead in titling it, Reading Elaine Salo as an Act of Feminist Solidarities and Decolonial Healing. And I just wanna say a little bit about what we mean by that. I mean, the first phrase there is that catches me and I think that is important to think about is feminist solidarities. What does it mean to create feminist solidarities uh, that really are about reconnecting uh, uh, um, with our feminist sisters um, with perhaps our feminist ancestors. Um, and Elaine is somebody who touched the lives of so many students, so many feminist colleagues and friends, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. And so this is about creating a kind of spiritual solidarity with Elaine's energies, what she created in the academic realm, in the intellectual, but also in the social political world of feminist organizing that myself, uh, uh, Connie Benson, Laura Houston, Benita Moorman, Elspeth, many others have been part of, Desiree Lewis. So it's about really uh, communing with that uh, uh, spiritual presence of Elaine that really manifests continuously in our own social reality around feminist organizing. And we draw on Elaine's thinking and writing in order to commune, you know, to be in solidarity with that energy and be in solidarity with each other. 
Um, what you have there on the screen is an extract of an article that went viral that Elaine uh, published in 2013. And uh, Connie Benson will speak more to that um, uh, and, and will speak more to why it is that this caption from the article shapes what we're doing in the reading group. What I'm going to do now is just speak about Elaine Sello. Who is Elaine Sello? And then we'll move into why the reading group. I've said a little bit about that, but each of us will speak about why we're in this reading group. And then what we're going to do is actually read a feminist thinker, writer, and activist uh, from Morocco, who is listed under the letter F uh, on that, uh, 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 an introductory to ABC on African feminisms that's on your screen. We're going to read, and this is what we do in the group. We read African feminists together uh, and we discern uh, 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 our reading of that person, our understanding of their work and their biography and, and what this means to our own uh, politics, feminist politics. So today we're going to read together Fatima Manisi uh, later on. But let me talk a little bit about Elaine Sello and who Elaine Sello was. And I think for some of us in terms of her energy, who she still is to us, um, and to do this, I'm going to draw, I'm going to actually read segments from an amazing article I found, uh, which is a, uh, a kind of biography. Uh, uh, you know, when somebody passes away and you write the story of their lives, just forgotten what it's called. <laughs> But that, and it's written by Kelly Gillespie, who is a feminist friend of mine, of many of us. And she uh, wrote this, it was published in a journal called Anthropology Southern Africa, published in 2017. And it's titled Elaine Rosa Sello, 1962, born 1962 and passed away in 2016. Elaine was only 54 when she passed away and she died of cancer. This was her actually second battle with cancer. Um, so Elaine was born in Kimberley right, in 1962. She was actually a daughter of uh, the late Rosa Sello uh, and uh, uh, Edgar Sello. Her mom, Rosa Sello, was a primary school teacher uh, in schools in the urban and rural areas around Kimberley, and her father, Edgar, uh, earned his living as a bricklayer, but also was an outstanding musician, and um, I remember actually that Elaine loved music uh, and I think it wasn't an accident that her partner was also a musician. Um, so her love for music, especially jazz, um, came from, uh, from her father's love for music and him being a jazz player himself. Now, um, Elaine, uh, uh, although she attended school in Kimberley, in secondary school, and did well to get into university and she, she got into the University of Cape Town in 1980. So this is during the height of apartheid, right? And so she got into UCT as a result of this very strange quota system that allowed a certain portion uh, 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 of historically colored uh, 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 South Africans to get into the University of Cape Town. And her parents wanted her to go to UCT apparently was because her brother went to UWC. At that time, UWC was going through huge uh, resistances. And, and I remember she used to tell me UWC was an occupied campus. They were high levels of militarism and militarization, both in the enforcement of the apartheid uh, segregation system, but also in the resistances to it. Um, so it was decided uh, by her parents that Elaine and her brother Ken, after their, their, this experience of violence on campus that Elaine's um, uh, elder brother faced, Bertram, that Elaine and, and her brother Ken would be sent to UCT for their studies. And they gained entrance through this racial, strange racial quota system by which historically white universities, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> maintained in order to, I guess, uh, begin to acknowledge that um, 
other people were worthy of, of education. So um, Elaine uh, mitigated UCT's institutional racism through her involvement in political work beyond the university. And very early on, she joined the United Women's Organization uh, launched in the Western Cape in 1981, uh, which joined forces with the Women's Front in 1986 to become the United Women's Congress as an important organization in the establishment of the UDF, the United Democratic Front. So Elaine was very active in community and church-based church movements on the Cape Flats, Flats as a result of her involvement in this uh, 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 women's rights feminist political activism against apartheid. Um, and in particular, she began connecting with women who were sustaining black community life in the thick of apartheid regimes, racial violence. Uh, and this experience of community-based political work set the terms not only for Elaine's political and intellectual commitments, but also for her future research site. She recognized in black working class women a capacity for care and world making in the face of really terrible life conditions, a capacity that became both a long-term research interest and a foundational impulse towards a lifelong commitment to feminism. Um, and although Elaine Sello, you know, uh, 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 came in and studied at UCT via the anthropological uh, department of anthropology, she was very critical of um, anthropology for its own dis uh, colonial disciplinary uh, roots. And so she did a lot to uh, uh, turn some of those anthropological uh, colonial uh, uh, research methods and methodologies on, on their heads. And for her PhD research, what she did is she used some anthropological, anthropological concepts of personhood and morality uh, um, uh, to show the life of women in Manenberg and how their lives could never be represented without a singular subject, nor a singular narrative. So what Elaine did is she wrestled with the task of bringing these long-standing anthropological concepts to life in a feminist and anti-racist writing, writing practice. In Elaine's writing, Mannenberg mothers could find the dignity to hold their families together in the toughest of corners, but wield the very same dignity as a means of, of humiliating their daughters. So she really depicted this contradictory power uh, of motherhood, both in, in bringing care, but also how uh, the pain of, of trauma, uh, you know, got passed on uh, from mother to daughter. And, and she, she looked at the intensity of, the, of relational life, you know, and always, uh, um, you know, how she showed that it's always in the process of negotiation, always uh, manifesting creative ways of living, ways of coping, ways of generating some kind of alternative moral world and an alternative local meaning of personhood. And she was really compelled into examining that. I worked with Elaine Sello at the African Gender Institute from the time I joined the African Gender Institute at UCT. I joined in 2008. And I found her to be the most boisterous and friendly and crazy workmate who uh, um, created such a gentle and playful, but also powerful landing into the acad academy for me who moved into the academy from uh, 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 civil society, women's rights organizing, um, and was really wary about what it meant to actually uh, uh, pretend <laughs> that I could teach a class in the academy and, and theorize. And what I found very powerful about Elaine is that she playfully dealt with very difficult uh, topics and she would throw into conversation um, things like her own battle with cancer, you know, she uh, herself had been through an operation and uh, she had, um, you know, uh, silicon uh, breast and she would pick it up out of her bra and just throw it. And then she would talk about what it means to walk around with one boob and, and go through that operation and still, you know, be proud and, and, and playful about 
uh, how sexy her body was or how awkward it might seem for people that she may, she, nobody may know she has one breast, but actually, you know, she will tell you and she will talk about it and how she would speak Afrikaans, you know, and just be playful about some of the ridiculousness, but also generational trauma uh, embedded in colored communities and, and how it's, it's, difficult to talk about and she would play with that. And in this article that um, I'm quoting from, you know, Kelly Gillespie also talks about how for a while, and this is Elaine, you know, um, writing about her own experiences at UCT. And this is a quote from, 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 from Elaine. She, she said, for a while, I refused to speak anything other than cups in the corridors of the African Gender Institute while recognizing the anger on the faces of other colleagues who have since left to become published renowned, renowned poets, social scientists, and, and such in global cor corridors of the academy. It is as if we were not good enough until we had proven ourselves in the civilizing North. And even then, even then we just about managed to get our foot in the door. So, I mean, I can say so much more about Elaine. I'm just going to hand over to, uh, I don't know how long I've spoken. I'm gonna hand over to Connie um, to talk about this article that went viral uh, uh, before she passed, she wrote it in 2013, that speaks to Elaine's politics with regards to African feminist knowledges and her incredible skill uh, in um, conversing with a wide range of feminists, many feminists that those of us stooped in our disciplinary silos, in her case, her colleagues in anthropology, just did not know of and did not know they didn't know. And, 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 and this insertion of African feminist writing and thinking in her critical decolonial, I would use the word now, uh, uh, um, uh, anthropological um, feminist analysis really brought a powerful um, community to many of us in her writing and in her being. So I'm just going to hand over to Connie to speak a little bit about Elaine from that, from the perspective of this article, but Connie will also speak about why the reading group, why we're doing this, convening this reading group. Thank you, Yeah, Liwei, um, and thank you everyone for, for being here and still being here um, this evening with us. This article, um, it, uh, Elaine wrote this article, the link is in the chat, um, in 2013 in response to someone from her own department, so someone who had an office two doors down from her at the University of Pretoria, um, who wrote an article, uh, someone a philosopher by the name of Louise Mabel, who wrote an article called The Puzzling Feminist Betrayal. This was a paper um, that basically argued um, that, that feminist scholars should be grateful for the arrival of Western civilization, um, that European, that, that Europe, uh, European feminism and Christianity is what brought women's rights came from Europe. Um, you, you, I mean, you can imagine, but you can also go and read the article that she wrote. And this was Elaine's um, response for someone kind of singing the praises of Calvinist Afrikaner traditions and arguing that feminists should, um, should really know, be educated and know the kind of roots of, of, of feminism. Um, and so Elaine wrote this article, which lays out her own trajectory uh, in feminist education coming from movements, coming from histories, coming from, from, from radical feminist histories um, across the world, um, and in, most importantly, including feminisms that look at race and class and geography and sexuality and personal history. So she lays it out in this article, it's an IOL article. Um, and at the end, she says, you know, we really have our humanities curriculum to blame for having people who are in these bubbles um, uh, 
and she she makes a parallel with Horton Hears a Who, uh, kind of children's book about like these little bubbles of worlds of bubbles. Um, this is, you know, before Trump, before Elaine was a pathbreaker in terms of how clearly she saw things and how loudly she said things. Um, and she she said these our humanities curriculums need change. This is 2013, you know, pre pre student movement um, or the 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 latest um, you know uh, the, the 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 latest student movement work. Um, and she then at the end of the article says, in the meantime, in the interest of public education on African feminist intellectual traditions, here is an introductory ABC on. Uh, African feminisms beyond South Africa. So, I mean, Elaine, this is only one of many things that Elaine Elaine wrote. And when she passed uh, away in 2016, Elaine was a a, a friend and a mentor um, to me. And um, at her funeral, um, Elsabeth Engelbrecht and I were speaking after the funeral about how can we, what can we do that is you know, how can we gather in a way that is really honoring Elaine, but also the what, what we needed at, at the time. And we decided to get together and read her work together. Um, and what started off as a very tiny little reading group has, is now five years in the, in the making. Um, and for us, really, we came together to read together, not as educators, not as organizers, um, but to bring whoever wanted to come together and take time. And we, we, we decided this was going to be a, a healing and learning and collective process. So nobody has to read in advance. It's not a reading club. It's a, you come and we, we, we start by first talking about Elaine. And it's always incredible the stories that people bring for those who knew her, and then um, for those who didn't know her. And at the, the first few sessions, we read her work. We read Elaine's work together. Um, and we unpacked it and we, we read. We would spend the first while talking about Elaine, and then we would just have some time of quiet reading. So you just had to steal the time. And no other preparation was needed. And we would read and then we would discuss together just where it landed and what it made people think of and what. So sometimes it's about the content. So, I mean, sometimes it goes in any direction. Um, and, you know, this panel is part of feminist feminism and archive. Um, and it's really a, an enacting or re-remembering of, of Elaine um, and a speaking to her and the issues that she cared most about in the ways that she embodied. So she was, you know, serious and hilarious and loud and unapologetic. And she spoke a lot and she listened a lot too. And so that's just what we do together. Um, and anyone is welcome to join us um, at any time. So what we did in 2016, we, we started off by reading Elaine's work at Triangle Project offices in town. Um, we, we read her work a few times and then we decided, we, and we read the, the, the obituary that you just read, Yeliwe, um, that, and Kelly uh, Gillespie joined us, I think on Skype it was back then, um, <laughs> to, to talk about the article. Um, and then we decided to start reading the ABCs that Elaine laid out for us. And we take it almost like an instruction of like, this is what you must do, a calling. Um, and so in 2017, we started with Ama Ata Aidu. Um, in 2018, we read Bessie Head. Um, then in 2018, in August, the month of Elaine's passing, we met at AGI and we read from Elaine's book, which was published, um, her thesis, which she had been working on to turn into a book. Um, I had worked as a research assistant for her at one point, going back to interview all the women that she interviewed in Mannenberg on one particular street in Mannenberg, she had interviewed two generations of women in a series of households. And she had asked me to interview a third generation like 15 years later. And she was busy turning that into a book. Um, so her thesis was then published, um, I forget the word, but after her passing. And so we read from that at AGI. Um, and then we picked back up, we read Kalite Bayela. The following year, we read Doria Shafiq. 
Um, and then again, in August, we came back to honoring Elaine. When Nawal al Sadawi passed away in 2021, it was the first time since COVID that we met because we didn't want to meet on Zoom. Like we, we needed this to be, you know, not work, um, but something, you know, that was rejuvenating. And so we didn't want to meet on Zoom, but we met in the park um, when Nawal al Sadawi passed on and read Nawal al Sadawi together. Um, and then this last August, we did have a session on Zoom. It was in memory of Elaine, and we read from Surfacing, um, the recently published book Surfacing, which was dedicated to Elaine, and Desiree Lewis um, spoke about why. Um, and so here we are at F, um, and I will introduce Fatima Mernisi, just a little bit of her um, biography before I pass on to Lorna, who will take us through like a short reading exercise. Um, you know, it's not the same on Zoom, but we're going to do, do what we can. Um, but Fatima Mernisi, so we follow this list, and it's interesting. Sometimes we know well the authors, sometimes we don't know at all. Um, sometimes we often talk about who else, you know, other feminists with the letter whose names start with F. Um, so Fatima Mernisi um, was a bold and prolific Moroccan writer. She passed away in 2015. She was, she was born in 24, sorry, 1940 in Fez. Um, and she was a writer and a researcher and an intellectual. Um, she was a feminist and a Muslim. And a lot of her life's work was dedicated to challenging the ideal of women being subordinate, silent, or passive. And through those ideas, she insists have nothing to do with Islam. Um, she grew up in a harem. She was educated in one of the first co-ed schools in Morocco. She then studied in Rabat and then France and then the USA. Uh, she taught sociology in Morocco and she loved writing and believed it was a great tool to influence people um, and advocate writing and reading over violence. Um, one of her, one of the things she's quoted in saying is, dignity means to have a dream, a powerful dream that gives you a vision, a world where you have a place where you engage in changing something. And on writing, she says, writing is one of the most ancient forms of prayer. To write is to believe communication is possible, that other people are good, that you can awaken their generosity and their desire to do better. Um, she's written many, many, many books. And um, if anyone has access to Women Writing Africa, there's a, there's a short biography of her in the Northern Region um, edition. Um, and so I won't say too much more about her, but I thank Elaine for, um, you know, reminding us of her work and to bringing us to, to reading her today. And so I'll pass on to Lorna. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great stuff. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so the reading that we're going to look at, and I'll ask Shark to just put that up on the, the screen, is Doing Daily Battle. It's called Doing Daily Battle, and it's actually a book that's a collection of interviews with Moroccan women, um, which was uh, written by Fatima, and obviously the interviews were conducted by her. Um, the, the book is translated by Mary Jo Lakeland. Um, and so we're reading it in English. And how we will proceed is I've just identified a few um, key paragraphs, which I'll read out loud. Um, and we'll also have it on the screen. So I will just ask Jacques to, to pay attention to the cues. And the, the images are a little pale. So I hope that people are able to to see clearly enough, but otherwise I'll be reading it. And then we open the floor and you can um, raise your hand if you'd like to make a contribution um, to the discussion. So just kicking off, this is, and we're just looking at the, working with the introduction. Um, the dialogue between the sexes, even if it takes place, is likely to end up in a monologue, according to Umar Ibn, Al Khattab, the just. How does Morocco appear through the words of its women? 
Is it a familiar Morocco that is the same as the, that described by men, or is it an unknown Morocco? What are the benchmarks, the reference points of the female view? Are they the same as those of the male view? What are the problems and struggles that emerge from the female view? The crucial struggles that justify life and structure it. So I'm just going to pause there and, and invite anyone to just comment. Um, any thoughts that grab you immediate, immediately from that section? Um, Habiba. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I. it just strikes me about how the male perspective defines what is normal and ordinary and familiar and how radical it is to recognize that, to know that, and then from that knowledge to seek the missing perspectives that actually will produce the new, the new way of seeing the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any other comments, views, responses? Okay, let's let's continue. So she goes on to say, however, it seems that women's Morocco is actually a territory where the struggles and problems are quite different. With women's words, the people who have been immersed in this woman beauty seduction discourse are going to find one surprise after the other. They're going to find themselves in unfamiliar territory. Only a minority of women and one that is disappearing still lives in a harem. For all the others, life is played out around the struggle for food, for wages, for some income, however minimal in the Morocco of women, earning one's living is the essential, is the essential concern and purpose in life. Women exist above all as economic agents, as sources of income, energy and work, ceaselessly struggling against poverty, unemployment and insecurity. In this collection of interviews, there's a single exception Patul bin Jaluna, raised in a harem in Fez during the 20s and married into another harem on the eve of World War II. But there are no more Batuls. Her counterpart today would be a woman equipped with university degrees and fired by fierce ambitions for salary and professional status. So I'll just pause there for any comment. Yaliwe or Kone, also if you would like to make any comment. Thanks, uh, Lorna. I see Paulo there. Okay. Um, and then I'll step in, yeah. Yeah, um, I was thinking about how um, the imaginaries, um, certain imaginaries of womanhood um, and how they sort of get fixed almost out of time um, and, and they continue to dominate, right? And there's something about this, perhaps with me being a literary person, but this is where this um, description takes me. Um, to the enduring imaginaries um, that do not pay attention to the actual lived um, of this moment. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that, but thank you. Yeah, I also was thinking about, you know, the first paragraph you read, Lorna, um, that, you know, it's masculine perspective of, mm -hmm. um, what it, it, it uh, uh, the the life of a, uh, a Moroccan woman um, 
is from that perspective is so different from what's actually happening to women. And so uh, Fatima Manisi is saying, if you just, you know, people who are attached to this imagination <laughs> of what femininity is like in Morocco from a patriarchal masculine view, if, you know, they would be shocked to actually mm. see that the everyday life is that of struggle of, of, of um, you know, no food and, you know, except for one woman who was middle class, who she says is equivalent to a professor in a university now who has a cush salary and, you know, so also highlighting, you know, well, it depends which woman in Morocco, uh, uh, um, you know, one would contrast that masculine patriarchal gaze with. Uh, so, yeah, it got me thinking about, about um, this facade of a masculine uh, worldview imagination and, and how that facade is differently revealed depending on, on which woman's um, perspective or lived reality uh, you look at it from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ali. And Paula, Paula, sorry, I missed your hand earlier. Um, so we're going to just go to the bottom of page of the page um, that we're on. These interviews reveal that, in fact, in low-income families, the husbands are often physically and economically absent, with unemployment and migration in search of work making them totally unable to take responsibility for their children. And then she continues at the bottom of the next page. In this introduction, I intend to argue that for a woman, the famous hierarchy that is maintained between infrastructure, economics, experience, and superstructure, ideology, perception, is an absurdity. In a society where change is viewed as an external attack and where tradition occupies a preeminent place in the so-called strategies for the future and for development policies, as is the case in the Muslim countries, ideology and perception have an over-determining influence. The problems confronting Morocco in its difficulties with development are ideological before they are economic. The problems our society faces today are not technological, which machine should be manufactured, but perceptual. What are the urgent problems that require a priority solution? The ability of the planner, the politician, and the intellectual to perceive, identify, and deal with national priority problems depends on the openness to the ideas of the masses, and they're applying these ideas. That is the ability to transcend their own subjectivity, their own perception of reality. One fact that the planners, politicians, and intellectuals often forget is that the masses are sexed and that women constitute half of them. We will see that the neglect of this fact has radical implications for the perception of and decision-making about the problems that ravage our society and sap its, en sap its energies, as well as for the required solutions. I found that uh, that paragraph uh, very powerful to read, considering we've just had our local government elections. Um, and, you know, it just raises the question of where is our strong women's party? That's going to, and maybe we don't want to have a women's party also, but then our strong women's movement, because um, it's precisely what she's saying here, you know, that where is the, the women's views um, and role in the decision making um, in that, in this moment in Morocco, but also I'm thinking uh, at this time in our country. Um, you know, Lorna, it, it makes me just, 
you know, you, as you read a book, you sort of reflect on the title and the title really sums up what she's talking about because it's called doing daily battle. And mm. sometimes it seems like we need to have new ideas, but like, what if the problems are old problems, you know, and it just, I think slowly reading through the introduction um, and the ways that she says the problems are mis are miscast. And so the solutions okay. are going to be miscast. And at, at what price? At the price of women who she's speaking to having to do daily battle just to survive. Um, but the way that they are depicted is not that they're doing daily battle or that there is a problem that they're up against. So I think it's very convincing, her arguments about perceptions and ideologies and their links to you know, material circumstances, but also to like visions of what solutions do we, do we need. Absolutely. Anybody else like to share their thoughts and comments? Uh, could we, could we, um, are you open to um, people also interacting on the chat so we can chat yes. and also read those responses Certainly. as well as um, get um, a conversation going in the room? Um, that would that would be interesting because I've, the, I, what I find fascinating about some of the, the women, some of, some of the feminists, the feminist work that um, is evoked on this ABC. And for example, someone like Fatima Mercy, me, who I didn't know until, um, you know, who I didn't know in the same sort of offhand manner that we know some other feminist names that sort of circulate, right? Um, where, um, and the connections that we can make um, between what is being described here, uh, and I was thinking of the bottom of the last page, um, Lorna, is um, when you're talking about the men and the absent um, men, I think it was the, it made me yes. think, as a connection, somehow it made me think of the migrant labor system, for example, um, and, and, and some of the connections that you make from places and different spaces um, that um, allow you to, to reflect, I think, um, uh, to, to, to make connections, I think, across the continent in, 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 in interesting ways and, and to, to create a certain sort of conversation that is not about, for example, the global north, right? Um, so, so I, you know, some of the resonances I think that are, that speak to both the particularity or the specificity of certain spaces, political spaces or national spaces, but also the commonalities. So, I mean, I, this was a really mess, messy way of, of thinking about it, but I was thinking about how, what it, evoked for me in terms of, um, mm. you know, the imagery or, or in terms of the example that is being used. I also see a comment on the YouTube channel, Yvette from YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of Habiba's mother, the way Islamic culture opens up spaces for women um, with the one hand while it closes it with the other is a source of enduring fascination to me virtual hug. <laughs> yes, and so that's actually a good segue to our next. Um, if we can go down to the page, um, about three pages, to the page with the number seven on it, at the bottom. Um, yes, that one. The marriage model operative in law and in the values affirmed by this discourse is an unbalanced and totally asymmetrical relationship in both economic and affective terms. And then the next page, we discover from the words of women that they have a totally subversive approach to the subject of the couple. They insist upon a conjugal couple based on economic and affective equality as the sole viable model 
and they are completely dedicated to creating it. On one end, they demand fidelity, and on the other, they show through their daily struggles that a poor man is worthy of being loved. The lives of the women interviewed here destroy by their mere example the key fantasy of the pervasive male discourse, namely that only an economically powerful man is worthy of being loved. In their own words, the women reveal that they love men, not because they are rich and generous, but because they can be loving. The women love the men, not for what men can give them in the way of money and material resources, but for what they can give in the way of affective resources. They demand to be loved, to have a privileged, exclusive relationship with their husbands. Material support is secondary, since they are able to support themselves. May I, may I read in response um, uh, uh, a comment that's been made in the chat from Please. Wicked in Please. response? Okay. Um, the last bit read by Lorna made me think of the current scourge of GBV and the failure to implement the national strategic plan. I think it was the part about the politics um, on gender-based violence and femicide. Um, the still unaccounted billions the president promised regarding combating GBV through the women's and youth development in the presidents. Moreover, how gender and sexuality struggles during movements, i.e. Um, FMF by female and LGBT QI plus students were relegated to the side as being disruptive of the movement. And there's something, uh, yeah, um, I think it's that the previous page where, where you were reading about the politics um, and um, how this sort of shapes the, the, the national um, mm -hmm. strategies, really. Once again, the resonance, um, you know. Lorna, uh, uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, before you step in, I just wanted to say we won't have time to read another bit. Yeah, so make thank you. The, yeah. Okay, great. So I wanted to say that for me, it was a very interesting piece, this, this segment on the love, um, the women that love their, their partners. Um, and and what's, but what's so powerful is that because she, it, in the way that she's she's written this, she's she's illustrating um, the contrast between the male discourse, which, as we've said earlier, is the the public narrative, and in many ways, it's the epistemological debate that is raging right now. Right, so she's constantly bringing forth the woman's uh, view and perspective, which she's got through the interviews. And this one's interesting because it's the idea that the man that's worthy of love is the powerful man. And often the powerful man is the man that is abusing, um, but also not only, right? It depends what, we, what we're looking at um, in, in the context of our soul, the powerful man can also abuse. But in this respect, there's the conversation of the man is loving, um, and so I can love him because he is loving toward me um, is the story that the women tell. But there's another piece that follows. So we're not going to read it, but I just wanted to, to point out, um, which is very interesting, that she speaks about and it brings in the intersectionality um, because she says, I discovered that these men were castrated like me of their right to the heritage and to the science, the monopoly par excellence of male power. These men had an entirely different attitude towards me. They did everything they could within their little power they had to give me confidence in myself and to help me to persist in my desire for self-expression. The, they are colleagues and friends in the faculty, the letters at the university. So this is her colleagues um, that she describes, but she's also like, her colleagues are these men, she's saying, you know, she sees 
that they, um, they fall into the same descriptor. Um, and so the comment, not to discount the comment that was made, um, but I just wanted to bring that together with that ending because I think it's so powerful um, and presents the intersectionality of, of struggles. Um, in, in their society in Morocco, it's about the classism that's at play. And so there's a solidarity between the partners. Um, I think absolutely, when we look at our current, um, the NSP and others can comment, um, and the, the problematic, I don't want to say lack of implementation because it's not that, it's more a problematic attitude, I think, um, and political lack of political will around these issues. Um, then we see precisely what she is talking about. Um, the this dominant male discourse that's really which she says is she says it of the marriage model but i think um it's true uh, in general um the marriage model she says operative in law but as i say we can think of it beyond that um is an unbalanced and totally asymmetrical relationship um and it's the nature of the power balance when it comes to addressing gender-based violence in our country, totally asymmetrical um, in both economic and affective terms. And that's absolutely, I mean, it's quite amazing to see how what she's written transcends into this day and time. I'll, st I'll stop there. I see there's some chat comments, Paulo. Oh, should I read them out? Um... The oh, that's the that's the chat comment that I had just okay. read from from Wekieti. but um, okay. you know what I wanted to say is that we've earlier today we had a a, a conversation about epistemic violence, right? Um, we've had quite a lot of conversations about erasure as well, and what I love about this reading group and the list that Elaine gives us is how reading is a practice. Um, of resistance, how reading um, and reading together also, mm -hmm. also importantly, how you're modeling um, the, the, the sort of strategies, right, um, that feminists adopt in terms of creating our own, I don't want to say canons, but uh, um, thinking carefully about what we read. Um, because what we read also informs what we write, right? Mm. And our citational practices and, and, you know, and the ethics of how we cite um, and the sort of conversations that we position ourselves in. And I mean, when, I, when the work that you're doing around reading just seems so important and so core actually to, to our knowledge production, right? I mean, to, to, to produce the knowledge, we actually also have to be reading each other and, and making these connections um, um, between our work, I mean, in, in between the work of various feminists. Um, and, and so we're, gonna, we're already running over time, but I just wanted to close um, this session. I couldn't help it. I, I asked for a little bit of, for some permission to do this. Um, but um, when I saw this, when you started talking, this made me remember a poem that was written about Elaine Salo by Danai Mopoza. It's about 10 lines long, but it was, it's in her poetry collection, Feeling and Ugly. Um, and I thought it would be just a fitting way to end um, this, this session. Um, so it's called Feminist Pedagogy. Elaine Salo taught me how to wash my panties. She could see that I was trying hard not to listen to my aunties and my grannies and my friends. She saw their sadness and their solidarity. She told me hand wash only with woolite on a Sunday afternoon. Elaine Salo showed me how to do this just like my mother had once tried. I made sure to try my hardest to never wear panties at all. And we loved each other anyway. 
and um thanks uh, for that follow yeah. um it, it just it felt um that there are so many ways in which we could take continue this conversation um but i would like to i think just close by honoring the person by ordering what she brought us and by ordering this list and this discussion in this reading group. So thank you, everybody. I'm sorry we've run over, um, way over time. Well, you know, the program, this is how things happen. Um, and tomorrow is our final day. It's an all Zoom day. Um, and um, we will, yeah, so bright and early, 9.30 tomorrow morning. Um, with a, a feminist dream think where we will encourage everybody to sort of chip in on their experiences of this week at around four o'clock. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you. And thank you, obviously. I'm terrible. <laughs> of course, thank you. Good thank you, Lorna. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody, Thanks, for listening in. Thanks, Connie and Lorna. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye.